This is Sunday Focus, a weekly public affairs program that looks at the topics affecting our society and the people who are making a change in the community each and every day. The people who have vision for the next generation. Sunday Focus presents new challenges for us, keeping you informed with topics of local and regional interest. Now the host of Sunday Focus, Christine Manica. Good morning. Coming up on the program today, Tanisa Islam, one of the candidates running for mayor of Sioux Falls, joins the program today. Sioux Falls City elections are Tuesday, April 12th. The big part of this election is to see who will be the mayor of Sioux Falls. We do our best at Results Town Square Media to keep the public informed on each candidate running. And Tanisa Islam is the latest and final mayor candidate joining me for Sunday Focus. Tanisa will talk about her background in government along with what she intends to focus on if she takes office for the city of Sioux Falls. That's all coming up on this edition of Sunday Focus. Were you exposed to hazardous materials while serving in the military and have an illness or condition as a result? If so, you may be eligible for VA benefits and services. Whether you need health care or want to file a disability compensation claim related to military exposures, VA is here to help. Visit va.gov forward slash military dash exposures to learn more and apply today. You served your country. Now let VA serve you. Welcome back to another edition of Sunday Focus. Now, we have been talking a lot about the Sioux Falls City elections, which, by the way, are happening Tuesday, April 12th. The big part of this election is to see who's going to be the mayor of our city. And we do our best to keep the public informed here at Results Town Square Media on each candidate running. Right now, the last of the three candidates is joining me, Tanisa Islam. Hey, Tanisa, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining the program today. There's a lot of information to go over in this segment, right? But let's just start off with some easy questions. Sure. Tell us about you. Where were you born and raised? Yes, I was born and raised in Michigan, born in Detroit and raised in a small town called Bay City, mm-hmm. uh, where I lived until I was done with college, Albion College. Then I went to grad school in Vermont and then law school in St. Paul and then landed here in Sioux Falls about 10 years ago. Wow. Well, so what made you come across Sioux Falls? Because that's usually not the first city on some one's radar when they're like, yeah, I'm going to move to Sioux Falls. Yeah, my husband, uh, Tim, he is a doctor at the VA, Mm -hmm. and we moved here back in 2012 for his internal medicine residency. So if anyone knows that process, you don't get a choice in where you go. You go where they tell you. Um, And it's been a great fit for us and our family. So what got you interested in politics? Well, honestly, I am a community advocate. Um, I'm an immigration lawyer in town. I started my own practice when I got a Bush Foundation Leadership Fellowship back in 2013 and have been advocating for access to services, um, making sure that vulnerable communities' voices are heard at decision-making tables. And this is really my life. Work. I've just added more tools in my tool belt over the years. Mm -hmm. Most recently, you know, with being an attorney and understanding laws and policies and how they impact. Uh, communities. So I don't really see it as politics. I think politics has a really negative connotation. What I say I'm doing is really advocating for everyday people and their access to the same amenities that we all have. Do you have any other previous background in government positions? Maybe you were class president (laughs) in grade school, anything like that. Yeah, I was class president in high school. However, I did right after law school. I worked for the city of Minneapolis for three, almost three years. Um, They have a civil rights department, which is very similar to the work that the city's Human Relations Commission does. Mm -hmm. It is obviously different, but similar in terms of context. And I was a complaint investigator investigator there for three years. Um, So I I do have quite a bit of really interesting city experience. Can you name some of them just since you you left the door open. And what are some of those experiences? Yeah, I mean, so my role as a complaint investigator was to look at complaints of discrimination according to the Minneapolis City Ordinance. 
um, and decide if there was discrimination in a case or not. So I would have to look at all the evidence and see if 51% of the evidence showed there was discrimination or not. I worked with a lot of different agencies within the city. Um, I got to know the police department really well through that work and all of the processes there and really built a lot of strong connections. I went with outreach teams to different communities so they knew about the work that we did along with police officers. So, And in my work today as an immigration lawyer, you know, at the organization I started in 2017, which is South Dakota Voices for Peace, we provide free legal services to children in immigration courts, as well as survivors of violence. Um, And I work very closely with detectives and police to advocate for our clients, and I, so I have really good relationships across the board with different city entities. So you've seen pretty much a whole range of Sioux Falls. You've seen the good and the and the not so great, if that's safe to say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's really important, especially for a candidate who's running for mayor, to really understand. Um, I will say the good and the the areas of improvement, and how and how we owe it. Um, as leaders in this community to every resident in our city to make sure that they have access um, to information and access to services and their voices are being heard no matter what. So who or what inspired you to run for mayor? Honestly, you know, the work that I've been doing at South Dakota Voices has been, the trajectory has been incredible. We've gone from two staff before the pandemic to nine staff today, and at our most we were 12. We really responded to the community's needs during the pandemic. Um, We started receiving calls from Smithfield employees um, as the outbreak was taking place within those four Mm -hmm. walls. And we knew because I watch national policy, I have to, and it impacts how I practice law here in South Dakota. So we knew from the first discussions of the CARES Relief Act that many people in our community would not have access to it like you and I did. You know, you and I benefited from getting a check in the mail, but not every person in our community did. So with understanding that, um, we had a team of two people and a really strong board of advisors and board of directors, as well as really key relationships across the state. And I said, we need to create an emergency relief fund for immigrant-led households in our state. And everybody agreed. And we raised $1.2 million in, in a short five months. We were able to give direct cash assistance to immigrant-led households who were not otherwise eligible for CARES relief. We helped over 1,700 households. We also helped businesses because many business owners uh, were not eligible for PPP, like a lot of us were that carried us through that time. So it's um, my work has always been asking the question, who is going to be left out from this policy or this law that's being created, which otherwise seems great for everybody else? But as a leader, making sure that everyone, again, has access to those same services that we do. So that really made me realize that a lot of the work that we were doing at a small nonprofit organization is work the city should have done. And after our relief fund was done, we started doing work on COVID vaccine education. And in our community, all information is pretty much in English. So that is a huge barrier for a multilingual community mm-hmm. specifically. And just access to information is difficult because a lot of our city entities, for example, have gone online. So if you don't have access to the internet, um, and I'm on the Digital Equity Task Force for the city, so I know what those numbers look like in our city. You have even, you know, there's all these barriers in terms of access to information. Sure, yeah. So we received um, a grant from the CDC that was going directly to community-based organizations. We were one of three organizations in South Dakota to receive that grant. So we put together an amazing outreach team that still exists today, and we sent people into communities to make sure that we understood what their fears were or what their misunderstandings were about the vaccine and helped to educate them through um, information. 
And then actually with the grant, we were able to work with South Dakota Urban Indian Health, which is also a nonprofit entity. Um, They have offices here in Sioux Falls as well as Pierre. And they had just received a huge shipment of vaccines, and we had these great outreach coordinators. So we partnered to host um, the the only vaccine pop-up clinics in our mall parking lot here in Sioux Falls. It was not the city health department. It was not the county. It was not the state. It was two small nonprofit organizations who came together to do this critical work. And again, you know, when you get a a chance to take a step back and really reflect on Mm -hmm. the work that you're doing and the impact that you're having, I just felt like the city really missed some really big opportunities. um, And they're catching up to that now. Um, In our city, our residents deserve more. And I know I'm the right leader to make sure that that's happening. Probably helps that you have your family to support you too, right? Well, I mean, yeah, my husband (laughs) and my boys are 100% in for sure. I have a seven-year-old and 11-year-old. Um, the seven-year-old is very excited about campaigning. The 11-year-old would rather watch sports on TV, but <laughs> we take him to events too. It's been really exciting for all of us. If you are just listening, I'm being joined by Tanisa Islam. She is one of the three candidates running for Mayor of Sioux Falls. Now, this could be the hardest question of the interview. Okay. When you think of the word mayor, mm-hmm. what are the first words that come to mind? Well, when I think of mayor, I'm thinking about Sioux Falls specifically. We're growing, we're thriving, we're prospering. Our communities are diversifying and growing in diversity as well as socioeconomic statuses. It's going to take, when I think of mayor, um, the word leader obviously comes up, but what I want to add to that is an inclusive leader, a leader that can have empathy towards all communities that are here to make sure that those voices are being heard around the table and informing how the city is making decisions. I think that's the biggest thing we're lacking in the city right now. Um, And to build a city that is going to be strong and to make sure that we don't make the same kind of mistakes that the Minneapolis's and the Omaha's have made. Made through their growth trajectory, mm-hmm. we're going to need someone who understands those. And and I, my entire life has been straddling all these different kind of worlds, if you will, and then really working um, on impact through advocacy and legal services. What qualities or characteristic do you think make a great leader or a mayor? For me specifically, because of the impact that I've had in the last 10 years, it's been to really listen. And it's been really to have the door wide open so anyone can walk through and feel like they can, Mm -hmm. um, that they are welcomed regardless of what their opinion is, that they will get someone um, specifically with me that will listen and take into consideration a lot of different opinions. You know, one example I'd love to give to really Uh, encapsulate what I'm talking about is when we first started our our COVID education work, you know, I went in with stereotypes and what the community would be thinking, you know, conspiracy theories or just misunderstandings of the efficacy of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Um, And we had outreach coordinators at Feeding South Dakota Lines, for example, and going to different businesses in the community, just asking people one on one. And what we heard over and over is people wanted to get the vaccine, but they they didn't know where to go or they didn't have time. So if you take a step back and think about it, people who are in a feeding South Dakota line, their priorities are very different, right? They're trying mm-hmm. to get food on the table. They have a lot of life stuff going on and yep. getting vaccinated is not a priority and that's okay. So we we heard that. You know, we really figured out what that would look like and what we could do to impact that particular population who just didn't have the time to get it. And that's why we decided on the mall parking lot, which is really accessible. And several of the people who stopped by that pop-up clinic um, from the months of June all the way through November said, you know, they had two jobs. They didn't have time to schedule it through a scheduling process like with Walgreens or Mm -hmm. Sanford. They saw that it was just available between shifts and they stopped because they knew it was going to take 10 to 15 minutes. So I want to give that example as really showing what kind of leader I am. You know, I I may have my opinions and my assumptions Mm -hmm. going into an issue, but I will always listen to what community is telling me and then, you know, 
kind of reiterate or if re-ideate, if you will, the direction that I thought we needed to go into to really go where the community needs me to go. Absolutely. Now, from my understanding, this is your first time running for mayor of Sioux Falls. So tell us about your political campaign journey so far. Yeah, this is my first time I've run for any office other than class president in my <laughs> senior year of high school. And while I never thought I would use this word, but the word I've been using to explain my experience is that it's been so fun. Um, I, not normal politicians yeah. would say that. That's surprising. <laughs> well, I, and I'm not a politician, and I think that's why I love people. Mm-hmm. I love hearing their stories. I love hearing what everyone loves about Sioux Falls. I love hearing from people what they want to see change or improved in Sioux Falls. There's always room for improvement. And, you know, I've been talking to people who want traffic calming measures all the way to people who want access to fresh fruits and vegetables in their neighborhoods. Um, You know, and it's really interesting and exciting that when you give community an opportunity to have a voice, that they use it. Um, My methodology has has always been to go to community rather than saying you need to come to me if you want to be heard. And um, that has been very powerful because people see themselves in me. They see themselves in this process, Mm -hmm. which otherwise they felt very voiceless in. And I'm just really excited to be able able to give them an opportunity to voice these things. As you hit the campaign trail, you're probably meeting a lot of new people and seeing some familiar faces, and you alluded to this already, but what are some changes that voters want to see in the city? Yeah, they, you know, I've been meeting with a a lot of young, energetic people, which I think is why it's been a really fun and Mm -hmm. they really fill my cup in terms of the energy needed to be on a campaign trail, plus have a full-time job, plus have a whole family to take care of. Um. And, you know, it doesn't matter what their age or race or gender has been. I've asked these young people, I've probably met between like four to 600 high school students and college students in combination since I announced in October. And I asked them two questions. The first is, how many of you are going to stay in Sioux Falls? And I've been sad to report that not one hand has gone up so mm. far. And I get it. I mean, I was from a small town. I wanted to get out of there after college and high school and go to the big city. But I'm a Midwestern girl, so I came back to the Midwest yeah. after being on the East Coast for about three years. Um, so I get that. You know, people should leave. They should leave and experience something else. But then I ask, well, what will bring you back? You know, what kind of city can I create for you that you would want to come back to? And overwhelming across these lines, people have answered, we want more representative leadership. And for me, that means a, quite a few different things. You know, I am a woman of color running to be mayor of Sioux Falls. So I think a lot of people are excited about this opportunity for change. Um, I am very inclusive in all of the work mm-hmm. that I've done. And I I have a 20-year track record of that, (laughs) 10 years here in Sioux Falls. And I think for those who want to see more inclusion and more inclusive efforts across the city, they see themselves in me too. And so I'm really, again, just really excited that I can provide that opportunity for change and hope in people who do want to come back to Sioux Falls. Now, like most candidates, there are certain policies that they tend to focus on when they do take office. Now, have you thought of any new policies that you would incorporate in the city? And if you can, can you run those down for us? Yeah, absolutely. There are some really huge issues. Um, We're at crisis point for a lot of different things in our city. And as as quickly as we've grown, been growing and how exciting that is, with that comes growth pains, if you will. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody knows we can't ignore these issues anymore, but everyone knows we have a housing crisis. We have a housing shortage for all of us. But what I want people to really think about is the vulnerable people in our community and how they have an extreme barrier to affordable housing and affordable rents. Um, The city right now does not talk about affordable housing. They talk about workforce housing. Mm -hmm. And 
everyone I've been asking who should know the answer to this question is still not clear what communities that means. For example, does that mean we're building housing for the DSU cybersecurity folks that are going to be making six-figure incomes when that place opens? Or are we talking about the Amazon worker that's going to be making $20 an hour? There's no clear direction on that. And if there's no clear direction, we can't build an equitable c- community. We don't have a master plan, which is really having all departments work together across the city to talk about these growth pains. Each department is talking about that individually, but we're not talking about a city as a whole. And when I think of the city, I see all of the departments connected together. You know, what what planning and development does impacts Parks and Recs, and what Mm -hmm. Parks and Recs does impacts Public Works, and so on and so forth. So we really need to have more of a comprehensive plan looking into the future and how, how all of these things impact each other. We're also at crisis point for access to child care. And it's oh, it's really interesting to me how the economic and business community has not forecasted what kind of crisis this would be. Look, these issues have been around for a long time, and they have gotten much worse in the last four mm-hmm. years. And if we don't have access to child care, that means that people aren't going to work, and we all know we have a workforce shortage here. Mm-hmm. If we don't have access to child care, sometimes parents are going to work and leaving their kids at home alone when they probably shouldn't be. And that creates another set of issues um, that the city needs to get involved with. You know, we like to talk about economic development, but there are some real barriers to getting workers in the workplace. And I will concentrate and work with experts in the fields in both affordable housing specifically as well as child care to really be innovative in how we're providing access so we can get workers to work and we can have kids who are safe at home or in a daycare facility, child care facility, um, and that we have everyone living in homes or apartments uh, that they can afford to rent. If you are just listening, Tanisa Islam, she is with me in the studio. She is one of the three candidates running for Mayor Sioux Falls. Now, do you see maybe some ordinances in the city that you would like to change a little bit? Why or why not? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, there's tons of ordinances for sure. Yes. But in this conversation of having managed and smart growth, Um, in our city and having a comprehensive master plan across departments, we have to look at ordinances because sometimes it's those ordinances that are holding back from building more affordable housing and how we think of um, easements and roads and who has access to that, who's paying for that. I've talked to a lot of people who have encouraged me to look at the ordinances and in terms of density and how we're building whether we're building up or out. And whenever you build out in the city sprawls, that becomes a really big concern for sustainable sustainability of the infrastructure, right? Because mm-hmm. if we build out, we got to maintain those sewers and there's roads forever. And though it might be exciting to build out right now in 20 years, that's going to hit the pocketbook of the city pretty hard when all those things need to be maintained. So really looking at ordinances and how they can be um, amended and tweaked so that we can build more densely in the city, Um, how we can make sure that ordinances are not impeding affordable housing um, and other accessible issues that we need our communities to have. You kind of alluded to this at the beginning of this interview, but it's hard not to talk about it, given the last couple of years, the global pandemic. It's been probably the biggest story in the last two years and leaders, politicians, they were faced with the difficult task of navigating communities like Sioux Falls through this pandemic. And there is no playbook on how to do this, how to navigate a city through a pandemic. But somehow we all manage. So let's just say, and hopefully this won't happen again anytime soon. I'm knocking on wood as I say that. Uh Let's say another pandemic makes its way to South Dakota. What would be your plan of action? Anything that maybe you would have liked to have done differently as opposed to what the city ended up doing? Yeah, that's that's a really big question. I'll start with saying, um, you know, I have worked for cities. 
I have built my own law practice and I have built a nonprofit organization and there were no playbooks for that. Mm -hmm. And I've been really successful and innovative in how I'm doing that work Mm -hmm. currently. When it came to the pandemic, yes, we all had to shift 180 degrees and I did too. As a mom, as a as a mom of students who were in schools that shut down, um, as a wife to a doctor who were uh, who is on the front lines of the pandemic and living it through him and our, you know, the tweaks we had to make as a family to mm-hmm. be safe, um, and also as a, the community advocate that was raising money for people to make sure they could have one more worse of rents um, or groceries on their table. So I'm saying all of this to say when there is crisis, I double down in how I can make sure that the most vulnerable people in the community will receive support and services. And in a health pandemic, it was obvious that it should have been our health experts that we listen to. But if you're a leader, leadership matters. People are watching and I will always lead by example. If it's a health pandemic, I will support and listen to health experts. If it's an economic pandemic, you know, if we get to another recession, I will listen to economic experts. That's why they've gone to school Mm -hmm. and dedicated their lives to this field. I'm not an expert in everything, right? I Mm -hmm. have my expertise, but the what I will always do uh, and I can guarantee to our community is I will always go to the experts in the field for answers, not anyone else. Anything else that you would like to add or mention this this is your time to to talk to the people (laughs) yeah um you know i have a very open campaign i've been doing tons of meet and greets if you are interested in having a conversation meet with me at these meet and greets please follow me on social media but because i really need to hear from you you know i am making a concerted effort to go to community when they've never been approached by city leadership before to really understand what their needs are. Um, And of course, I can't get to everyone, but if there's a way to have those conversations with folks that I haven't gotten to, I would love to have that opportunity. You know, it's a really exciting time in Sioux Falls. You know, we're growing, we're thriving, we're prospering, but we have to have an eye on the issues that come along with growth. You know, one of the things that I'm really worried about um, is how segregated our city is becoming based on socioeconomic class. Um, I was just reading some statistics about our Sioux Falls Public School District, and we have 10 Title I schools. And my understanding is that all of those Title I schools have almost 100% of their student population is on free and reduced um, meals mm-hmm. in the school. And just a caveat, all, all lunches are free right now mm-hmm. for all across the school district. Um, but that was before that took place this past school year. That is really unacceptable, you know, and when you look at how schools are, neighborhoods go to the schools, right? Mm-hmm. Kids have parents. Those parents are, are at poverty levels. They can't afford a $280,000 house, which is where the city is investing housing resources in to right now. We have to think um, across the board, otherwise we're going to have the same issues that we see other big cities having right now. We're not there yet, and in order to not fall into those deep holes, we need leadership who really understands these issues and how to make sure that we don't fall into those traps. And I am that leader because that's the work I've been doing for 20 years. If you are just listening, Tanisa is um, one of the candidates running for mayor of Sioux Falls. Now, Tanisa, you mentioned your social media. What is that social media or website that people can contact and see what you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. So website is tanisa for sfcom On Facebook, it's Tanisa for Sioux Falls. And on Instagram and Twitter, it's tanisa for sf Thank you so much, Tanisa, for joining us this morning. Yeah, thank you for having me. Here's a news flash for you. More than 70% of fatal crashes in South Dakota happen on rural highways and local county roads. Hi, I'm Trooper Whitaker with the South Dakota Highway Patrol. It is important to wear your seatbelt whether you are headed to the farm or whether you are headed to the city. Seatbelts are one of the best ways to protect yourself while driving. Always wear a seatbelt. Don't skip the click. This message is brought to you by the South Dakota Highway Patrol and results Town Square Media. 
I'm Christine Manica, and you've been listening to Sunday Focus. I'd like to thank Tanisa Islam for joining the program today. Once again, the Sioux Falls City elections are Tuesday, April 12th, so make sure you get registered to vote. Join us again next week for another edition of Sunday Focus. Sunday Focus is a public affairs program of Results Radio, Town Square Media, Sioux Falls.